people are very confused. They're very confused about our health, very concerned about our planet. Everyone's looking for that one magic goji berry that they can take so that they can avoid actually doing the hard work of eating well every single day and sleeping well every single night. They don't want to work out. They just want to eat a goji berry and be done with it. And so it's much easier to pin all of our uncomfortable feelings on an object than it is to actually deal with the actual problems. Diana, welcome to the show. Hi. Nice to have uh, nice to, nice to have me. Nice to be here. Thank you so much, Chris. It is nice to have you. Um, <laughs> your work is at the intersection of nutrition, environmental sustainability, animal welfare, and social justice. That is that's just all of those are minefields, and everyone's emotionally charged. Like that's an incredibly harsh war zone to exist in. Mm-hmm. That's right. <laughs> 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 the, the look at the look the look of a PTSD battle scarred uh, soldier there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that you know a lot of people will say uh you know eating meat is wrong, killing animals is wrong, right? But you can't have an ethical discussion until you understand the nutritional benefits that animal products have to humans especially people that don't have the privilege to be pushing that away, which gets into social justice. We can't be telling the entire world that everyone needs to uh, be vegetarian when there are so many people that are nutrient deficient and malnourished. Um, And then when we, you know, look at the environmental consequences of a food system without animal inputs, that looks a whole lot like chemical agriculture, which is a huge problem, right? And so, when we when we look at you know chemical agriculture plant based only foods those two things are the recipe for fake meat uh you know absolute destruction um of our soil health ecosystem health and human health so uh i try to tackle all of those things because they're all so intricately twined and so I want people to understand all of those things before we have a discussion about whether or not it's okay for an animal to die for us to live. There's some entry prices that you need to pay before we can get to just the ethical question because mm-hmm. it's layered within other uh, other topics. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. What does a, a, a real food licensed registered dietitian nutritionist mean? What What's that? It's my own... Um uh, term, but basically most dietitians are, um, giving out information that they've learned in school where, you know, everything in moderation is okay. Let's not eliminate any foods from the plate. It's all about just portions. And, um, and if you want to go vegetarian or vegan, then, you know, that's totally okay. But then when we start to talk about eliminating processed foods, oh no, we can't do that. So, um, you know, so something like a whole 30 paleo keto type diet is absolute blasphemy, right? But then vegan or vegetarian are totally okay. Um, and so I call myself a real food dietitian because I focus on real foods and work largely with people to fix their gut health and their metabolic health or weight by getting rid of ultra processed foods. Got you. You've got a new film, which will be out almost exactly 20 second of November, uh, which is probably not far off when this is going to go live. So can you give us give us an overview of it? Yeah. So I have a book and film. Uh, the book came out in the summer um, of this past year, Sacred Cow. And the film uh, took just a little bit uh, more time to edit. I wanted them to line up perfectly, but it just wasn't going to happen that way. Um, <clears throat> so the film, I actually did some filming in the UK. I went to the Lake District and filmed with James Rebanks, who is sort of a celebrity shepherd there. And, uh, and he has a new book out actually as well. Um, so we went there, we went to a lot of other farms and other food producers, nutrition experts, and really put together, uh, as detailed as we could um, in one hour and 20 minutes. Uh, so the book goes obviously much more into detail, but we're just trying to explain why meat is actually not the main cause of diabetes, obesity, and heart disease, why nutrition studies are completely based on observational research and not um, they can't prove cause. So all those studies talking about 
uh, meat causing health problems are really based on just look, oh, look, this population ate meat, this one didn't, oh, it must have been the meat when there's just so many other confounding factors involved there. So humans have been eating meat for three and a half million years. And uh, it's much more likely, as Zoe Harkum says in our book, that modern foods are responsible for modern illnesses. Um, we also talk about the environmental case for raising uh, animals in a way that more closely mirrors nature. And uh, we dive in and out of the ethics argument throughout the film. So where the book is very um, scientific and linear and just tackles one argument at the time, um, that would make a probably a very boring film. And so, uh, so I worked with some really smart writers and editors that were able to take all of the footage that I shot and um, t turn that into a really awesome film. That's awesome. I, I always think this whenever anyone talks about the correlation and causation of stuff they do in their life. Like my, my mum, even today, said something about this new magnesium supplement that I've been taking. So, so, so how's it affecting your sleep? I'm like, I don't know. Like, I, it, it needs to have such an unbelievable impact itself for me to be able to work it out in amongst the chaos of everything else that's going on. And as you hit upon there, like, someone that does or doesn't eat meat is probably going to correlate with them doing or not doing a whole bunch of other stuff. All that it is mm -hmm. is essentially a selection variable. And that selection variable will probably be correlated with other selection variables. They're more likely to cycle to work. They're more likely to be left-handed and and single and vote Democrat and do a blah, blah. You know what I mean? Like it's the whole host of mm -hmm. other things. Right. So when they've done studies adjusting for those things, they found absolutely no benefit at all in um, eliminating meat from the diet. So, And what we do know is that people who don't eat meat, especially vegans, um, uh, much higher rates of nutrient deficiencies or insufficiencies. And um, that can express itself in mental health as well as in physical health. What was the particular studies that brought that to light, the one that's obviously been controlled for multivariate so, analysis? Mm -hmm. There was one that uh, looked at people who only shopped at health food stores. So then you've got the people who are more likely, you know, they, they tend to have a similar lifestyle, right? They're more likely to cycle to work or do, do yoga. Yeah. Or, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, they're less likely to be heavy smokers and drinkers, things like that. Um, so of the population that shopped at health food stores, there was absolutely no difference in longevity between meat eaters and uh, vegetarians. And then there was a very large study out of Australia. So it was about almost 70,000 people. And it took... Um, it, it, it looked at all of the, the meat versus no meat and adjusted for all of the lifestyle variables that they could and, again, found no benefit at all. Wow. So meat eaters and vegans live the same amount of time? Well, vegetarians. Vegans, but we don't have a lot of data on long-lived vegans because most of them give it up within three months. Um, and there's never been a vegan population. Um, we've never seen the consequences of vegan babies being born to vegan mothers and then trying to reproduce themselves. Um, but we do know that there are nutrients in animal source foods that you can't get from plants that um, supplementing isn't always um, adequate. Um, there's a lot of reasons why people wouldn't do well without animal source foods. So for example, um, vitamin A is a good example of this. So uh, the, the form of vitamin A that's in plant source foods is beta carotene. And when we eat something like a sweet potato or a carrot that has beta carotene, that's the orange color, our bodies need to convert that into retinol. So that's the active form of vitamin A. And about half of all humans can't do that effectively. Half so of 50% the, of the people listening to this can't digest carrots properly. Can't, well, they can digest carrots, but they can't necessarily convert all the beta carotene into vitamin A and so could end up with a vitamin A deficiency, which um, is not so great for your skin and your eyes. Um, those little bumps that some people have on the back of their arms is usually vitamin A deficiency. Great source of vitamin A is liver or any uh, animal source fat usually has a lot of vitamin A. Wow. That's so interesting. Mm -hmm. You say that meat has become a scapegoat. What's that mean? So, um, 
people are very confused. They're very confused about our health, uh, very concerned about our, our planet. Um, everyone's looking for that one magic goji berry that they can take so that they can avoid actually doing the hard work of eating well every single day and sleeping well every single night, right? They don't want to work out. They just want to eat a goji berry and be done with it, right? And so um, it's much easier to pin all of our uncomfortable feelings on an object than it is to actually deal with the actual problems. Um, so uh, a scapegoat is literally something that would be the sacrificial animal where people would put their sins on it and, and sacrifice it. Right. And so, um, meat has, that was going to be the title for the film and the book was, was scapegoat. And that's because, uh, you know, cow farts are ruining the environment when that's absolutely ridiculous. It's, uh, fossil fuels, it's consumerism, it's, it's all the junk that we keep on buying, all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, the, the, the problem for our nutrition and, and, you know, growing rates of obesity is not meat eating when, you know, you can get 30 grams of protein from 200 calories worth of steak, which has, you know, B12, which has all the essential um, amino acids. It, it's the, it's the most beautiful package of concentrated nutrition for humans, uh, and the most bioavailable, easily digested food we have. Um, and yet it's become, you know, meat, meat represents so many things to humans, it's power and masculinity and death, it's bloody, it's strong. Um, so especially young women are easy prey for these vegan propaganda documentaries, because um, they're much more likely to feel extra uncomfortable with all of those messages. Um, so a lot of people, I'm sure you've met people that won't eat anything on a bone, right? They don't want to, they don't even want to know, or maybe you haven't. No, they want to detach themselves away from yeah, the, the fact so that like it a, was an animal. Right. So like boneless, skinless chicken breast. Okay. Because it's sort of like tofu and you don't have to like think about it having been an animal. And maybe even the idea of chickens isn't as close to a dog where a cow would be closer to a dog, which is our friend, not an animal or a child, you know? So, um, so cattle, you're cracking up. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. <laughs> it's funny. To... <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> uh, anyway, so, um, so it just seems that on the totem pole of ethicalness of, of meat, of food consumption, cows are at the bottom, right? They're the absolute you know, is, cow, is cow the, is cow like the, the rich white man of the, the food group world? Probably. Yeah. And then you, you know, then it's like chicken and fish, you know, pescatarians or like, I'm a vegetarian, but I eat fish. And so you're like slightly more pure. Right. And then, you know, vegetarian would be just eggs and dairy, but then vegan, but then above that there's raw vegan and fruititarian, right. Things that only fall. So you wouldn't eat anything that might've been harvested and harming things. You would only eat things that have fallen already. Hang on, so that's a um, that's then, a diet that's a diet that's based on purely on gravity. The gravity well, diet. Well, then there's gravitarian, gravitarian, right? Which would be uh if you are ultra pure, then you only need air, right? So all of this is is absolutely ridiculous, right? Yes, but yes, even it the is. idea that eating meat is bad when humans are biologically omnivores, when meat has been something that has been, that's why we have such large brains right now. It's because of animal source foods. And so to be so um, disconnected from the fact that humans are animals and that there is a biologically appropriate food for us um, and that we are um, intertwined within a food web instead of on top of it and controlling it and dominating it is, um, is really at the heart of what I talk about. It's our, um, our denial of death. I mean, we even see it in the, in the fitness world, right? Like longevity, everyone wants longevity. Um, you, you know, it, it's, it's not even quality of life. It's just, how can I live the longest? You know, how can I cheat death? Um, you know, most Americans don't have a will. We don't want to think about death. We, we don't see it on a regular basis and we don't accept that it's part of the cycle of life. It's not just the end point of everything. So I kind of get through all of that stuff in the book more so than in the film, but in the film, we talk about it too. Do you know who Sheldon Solomon is? Mm -mm. Okay. So he's an expert in Ernest Becker's denial of death. He was on the show 
uh, a couple of weeks ago, and he's oh, I have that book. I have it's on my food politics book uh, bookcase, book we which I didn't earlier. realize was even a topic. Yeah, um, denial of death, fantastic, <laughs> fantastic insight. Kind of bit of a heavy read. I will. It's not like a, an easy one as you go to bed. Um, I know that you have done your research, especially for the book, and also subsequently for the film. I want to close one of the doors to hell that we've left ajar there about the methane argument. What is mm-hmm. the contribution of livestock to uh, greenhouse gases and greenhouse gas effect, please? Okay, so there's there's a couple different ways you have to understand it. So this is a little bit longer than, um, than An you answer. might. Yeah, yeah, right. It no big deal is is the fast answer. Um, so two things. One is methane through biogenic sources needs to be viewed completely differently than from fossil fuel extraction. So um, I have an animation in the film and an infographic about this on my Instagram feed um, and available on my website. But basically we show the molecules being breathed out by a cow. So it's not cow farts, actually. It's um, belching from cows. That so it's bur- cow burps that cause methane. It's cow burps. Well, that cause... That- it's the bacteria in their stomachs that's causing um, the methane, right? So they're breaking down um, very fibrous materials in an anaerobic way, which produces methane, okay? So m- almost all of the food that those cows would eat, if they weren't eating it, would just sit in a pile and emit greenhouse gases if we didn't turn it into protein, right? So we just have to sort of talk about that. The grass is still going to be there. Um, so when the cow breathes out methane, it goes up into the atmosphere, it lasts for about 10 years, and then it gets broken down into H2O, which is water, which becomes part of the water cycle, which is rain, and then CO2, which is taken up by the plants again, and, uh, they breathe, they respire oxygen, which is what we breathe in, and then the carbon goes down into the ground, it uh, feeds the microbes underground, the carbon becomes the grass, that's what it is, the cow eats the carbon, um, and it goes back into their digestive cycle, some of that carbon turns into meat that we eat, some of it turns into poop that uh, fertilizes the ground again, so it's all these molecules are working in, if you could just picture the swirl of bubbles, that's, that's what a biogenic cycle is, okay, and there aren't really more cattle than there were wild ruminants before we sort of took over and got rid of it. So we don't have more belching animals um, than we did when we had like the bison uh, in, in the you know 1500s before we went and killed them all, right? Um, so when we talk about fossil fuels, that is a one-way street. So we're extracting ancient, ancient carbon and methane that's been locked in the earth's core for millions of years And we're pumping it straight up into the atmosphere. So it's not really circulating in the same way that the methane from a cow is being uh, burped out. So does that make sense? So it does. Surely the the methane, like a one, oh, go ahead. The methane from both will break down at the same rate though, right? 10, 10 years or so. Yeah. Yeah. It's not, it's different. It's not that it's going to be treated differently, but because there's no balance to the fossil fuel equation, it just gets used and, and blown into the atmosphere. It's extra carbon, right? So if you picture like, if you were to picture one of those little um, ecosphere glass things, you know what I'm talking about? What are they called? Uh, bio- biosphere, is it? Biosphere, right. It would be like the fossil fuels were pumping in extra gases into that, right? Because they're being extracted not from the biogenic natural cycles that are already happening in there. It's from like way locked away carbon that, you know, is outside of that biosphere that then we're going to be pumping in and it's too much. I'm blown away. The the, the main breathtaking takeaway from today is that it comes from cow burps, not cow farts like that. <laughs> that's just totally tech. And there's something about that as well. Like even just in that little example, I think it shows that there's something less icky or something more icky about it being a fart that goes into the air and slightly less <laughs> icky about it being a burp. I don't, I don't know where I feel about that. So you, you said yeah, about the- but there's, and then there's a little more to the story too. So I can, let, us, let me, uh, so, um, 
just as far as the emissions go, like worldwide, when the, when we're talking about numbers and you're hearing that, you know, uh, livestock are worse than the entire transportation sector, because that's like a common thing that people say, that is actually completely not true either. So globally, cattle, uh, livestock in general contribute about 5% of all um, greenhouse gases. But again, it's part of a cycle. Um, transportation, energy production, all of that is the lion's share of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And when you were, if you were to look at the global warming trends uh, and CO2 concentrations rising, it is lockstep with the industrial revolution and the transportation industry taking off. So um, it, it, you know, we don't, cattle are not the cause in any way of, of uh, all the problems we have in the environment. Now, um, there are different ways to raise them. Concentrated manure is a problem. Um, feedlots can be not great places for cattle to be, although the, they don't spend their entire lives on feedlots. They're only there for the last few months of their lives. Uh, so all cattle for beef start on grass. Um, guess what? The UK is really good at producing grass. Um, and, I, you know, I've, I've been there. It's um, especially when you go north you don't have a whole lot of vegetable production happening, right? Like there's just, you have to import most of the vegetables that, that are coming there, especially in the winter. And, um, but the great thing is grazing animals thrive in, you know, lush green pastures, which, um, you know, is the ideal place for, uh, you know, them to be not cropping. Got you. So we've talked about meat being a scapegoat. Who mm -hmm. is it that wins? when meat gets vilified? So the fossil fuel industry loves that all of the attention is on cow farts and not on gasoline and, and fossil fuels and, and, uh, and all of that, right? So they love this. Um, also, the ultra processed food industry loves it because it gives them a pass. So instead of potato chips and, um, you know, junk food being the problem, it's just meat, right? So, so if you could just eat something that's meat free, then you're fine, right? It's just sort of like in the 80s and 90s when it was fat free, it was fine. And we know that that was completely ridiculous. Um, and so, you know, the, the biggest winners, though, are the Beyond Meat, Impossible Foods, and all the money that's going right now into um, the production of lab grown meats. So uh, there's big money, there's, you know, lots of stocks, lots of hopes placed on these alternatives. Um, and I looked up the price of Beyond Meat and one of those burger patties is actually twice as expensive as organic grass fed beef here in the US. Um, but it's being pushed as something that's, you know, cleaner nutritionally, better for the environment and oh, no animals died. Um, but what we point out in the film and the book is that there is no food system where no animals die. That's impossible because even in the production of your pea proteins or your soy or your wheat, tons of animals have to die in order for that to be grown. So if you then can understand that no animals die, uh, I mean, that there is no animal, that there is no deathless system, uh, sorry, that was a hard one to get out, then then the only solution is to make sure that the death that happened for your food was done well, right? Um, and so one large ruminant, like a cow, can provide 500 pounds of meat. When, if you were to equate a mammal to a mammal, so if a mouse's life, if a death to a mouse is as traumatic as a death to a cow, you know, if those two things are equal, then clearly the solution, if you're trying to live a diet of least harm, would be to eat a cow because so many rodents are killed in the production of grains and, um, and other, you know, plant-based proteins. Yeah, I, I want to loop back to the philosophical discussion, the ethical side of this in a little bit. I have a, a good friend, Alex O'Connor, who is a, a big vegan philosopher coming out of Oxford. Uh, and I had literally was speaking to him earlier on today. So I, I have a, a couple of things that he mentioned to me. But you've highlighted something that's quite interesting there, which is um, the polarity that most people would expect when they hear this is a book about me is this is a book about not veganism. And it seems to me that you're primarily opposed 
to processed foods rather than people who eat whole foods that are slightly different. Is that right? And is the meat eater versus plant eater debate making us take our eye off the ball? Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's, we're arguing about the wrong thing. Um, it's not meat versus no meat. And, um, I'm all for people to have their own choice when it comes to what they feed themselves. Um, as a mother and dietitian, I do have a problem with people not, uh, allowing children to eat meat because that can cause some serious problems. And we've seen in the literature of well, like, babies dying from, uh, being on a vegan diet. So what are the, um, what are the deficiencies you get as a, an infant from no meat? Primarily B12, which is required for, I mean, a, a B12 deficiency can cause permanent brain damage. And you can't just supplement that out? Not necessarily. So there have been cases of vegan, exclusively breastfed babies to vegan mothers who were taking B12 and the baby died. From some downstream effect of B12 deficiency. That is mm -hmm. terrifying. Yeah. Um, and another nutrient that is, uh, so B12 and iron are two of the most common nutrient deficiencies worldwide. It's really hard to get the iron you need from spinach or from plant-based sources. Um, B, uh, iron deficiency causes, um, also, uh, well, it causes stunting because you need iron to grow, but it can also cause, um, delayed, um, you know, learning problems. And there's only been one clinical control trial, uh, a randomized control trial looking at children and meat versus less meat or no meat in their diets. And the group that got the meat supplement excelled physically, behaviorally, and um, physically. So we know that pulling meat away from kids is not going to do them as good as actually giving them uh, a little bit more meat. And so, um, you know, that needs to be considered when we're having these policies like Meat Free Mondays uh, in schools, because they're based on not, no science at all. It's just, you know, it feels like the right thing to do. We should just make our make those kids not eat meat. It really is difficult to bifurcate the emotional component to a lot of this discussion. And I think, you know, if, if there was a, a s subtitle to 2020, it's that, like, yeah, I know there might be some facts, or I don't know the facts, but this feels right. Mm -hmm. um, Definitely. So, yeah, yeah. The, the, the world of fast, easy news and a tweet which can be untrue but reach a million people, I think, sadly, probably doesn't necessarily help this situation i mean there wouldn't be or there shouldn't be anyone that wouldn't get behind processed foods free monday like processed foods free monday would be like that's probably not a bad idea but yeah meat, meat whole foods wednesday i guess that doesn't whole work foods as well. wednesday <laughs> hey, i don't mind i'm all right with whole foods wednesday what one of the things that i have seen promulgated a lot online is we're already eating too much meat isn't that the case Oh. Is not the case at all. So um, most people aren't getting, you know, the the RDA for protein is way too low. Um, and I go through that in detail in the book. So that's a recommended daily allowance here in the US. I don't know um, what you call it in the UK. Same thing. Uh, RDA. Um, so what is it over there? Is it 0.8 grams per kilogram? Do you know? Uh, I don't know. I think it's 10%, maybe 10 or 15% perhaps uh, of total diet of uh, total I calories think so yeah which is way too low too so we have two um measurements here we have pounds per uh grams per kilogram of body weight but of course in the u.s nobody knows what a gram is or what a kilogram is right so <laughs> they do the math for you and they base it on an ideal body weight for women of 125 uh, pounds which is way less than what i weigh and just way too low. And for men, 154 pounds. Wow. Yeah. I would be seriously un malnourished if I was eating what 154 pound man eats. Right. And, and the RDA is the minimum, not the optimal amount. So it's the minimum for the, for the light weight. For the skinny people <laughs> that don't do anything. America's a know? big, America's a big country as well. You got some. Right. So some... the average American woman is 166 pounds. The average American man is 195 pounds. So when you then go, okay, 0.8 grams per kilogram times, uh, you know, what do we need when we look at 166 pound woman? It's twice the RDA. Uh-huh. 
Um, and then when you look at anyone who's in a growth stage, uh, so ba babies, um, children, adolescents, pregnant women, lactating women, or anyone over 40, when we start to lose muscle mass, they need twice as much protein. So really, people are eating way under the protein. Almost all age groups are getting less than even the RDA of protein right now. Um, and so my recommendation is to at least start at 1.6 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight, which is almost nobody walks into my nutrition practice, even eating the RDA of protein, you know, and then wondering why they're so hungry all the time and tired and why they can't lose weight. And the magical thing about upping someone's protein, especially from animal sources is they lose weight. They have more energy. They're full all day long. Protein is the most satiating macronutrient. Um, and here in America, we're only eating about two ounces of beef per person per day. So that's not like these, you know, massive tomahawk steaks every single night, but, but that's what the perception is. Uh, we're clearly eating too much meat. And again, that's based on an environmental, I feel like we're eating too much meat. And what that really means is I don't like what feedlots look like. It's gross. I think we should stop them and, you know, do something different. That's, that's what is actually like, if you could do like a thought bubble over someone's head, that's what they're thinking. Um, we're eating way more chicken than we ever have before. And chicken is less nutrient dense than beef. And we're also eating twice as much processed foods as we did in the 1970s. And so we've seen our obesity and uh, diabetes rates soar because of this. We're eating less meat than ever uh, than, than 1970. Um, and again and again, when I increase someone's meat intake. And I tell them like, okay, why don't you, I'll take a 160 pound woman that wants to lose weight. And I'll say, okay, how about you try eating 130 grams of protein a day? They can't even do it. They, they're so full and they think it's so wrong, you know, but that's, that's what works. That's, that's my like magical ticket. Now nobody has to come see me as a dietitian because that's like pretty much what I charge people to do. Guess what? You need more protein. Eat more protein, and so do you, and so do you. Right, everybody come yep. in here. We're going to have a mega church sermon. Everybody here needs some more protein. Yeah, I'm, I mean, anyone who's ever tried to hit two grams per kilo of body weight who oh is, like, un, untrained or unused to it, um, yeah. it's it's challenging. Like, no one, nobody accidentally eats two grams per kilo of body weight of protein. You, you would have to be just an unbelievable like ridiculous portion control person yeah it would be insane and therefore we heavily rely on supplements so what mm -hmm. is or what are some of your best pieces of advice for someone who needs to get more protein in you've just identified mm -hmm. there that you say 160 pound woman 130 grams of protein i can't get it in what are <laughs> what are some of the ways the <laughs> <laughs> Stop laughing. <laughs> no, no, you laughed at I can't get it in first. And now, and then I saw you laughing and now I'm laughing. Okay, I'm changing. Breakfast. How can we, how can people eat? Breakfast. Breakfast is the number one way to get. So if we can get at least just 30 grams of, of animal source food, animal source protein in at breakfast, that really sets the metabolism and sets your um, appetite for the whole rest of the day. So, um, and surprisingly eggs are so low in protein. Everyone's like, well, I hate eggs. And I'm like, well, who said you have to eat eggs for breakfast? Eggs, but breakfast. they think that that's the rule, right? That's, that's, that's the egg and cereal industry telling us that breakfast cereals and eggs are what you eat for breakfast. So this morning for breakfast, I had some meatballs, I think. And then for lunch, I just had like a big piece of, um, uh, fish, uh, with some vegetables on the side. So I'm not telling people not to eat vegetables. I'm just saying if you, if weight is an issue for you, or if you don't want to gain weight, which most of us don't, um, or if you want to put on some muscle or if you want to have more energy, then consider increasing your protein. And it's a lot easier. Usually people are not eating enough protein in the morning. Um, with breakfast. So it's easier to think of, you know, maybe eating like six ounces of, um, 
steak or pork or chicken or something or fish with lunch or dinner. But for some reason with breakfast, people are thinking, oh, I just want a little piece of toast and, you know, no. You other need, than, you other know, than meatballs, what, what else can we do on a morning? Because, I, I, you know, <laughs> it's, I, I'm a fan of meatballs, but I can't see me having it every morning for breakfast. Yeah, sausages, um, leftover steak from the night before. Um, I'll make eggs, but I'll put a ton of ham in them. Um, a little bit of cheddar cheese. That's a good source of protein, too. Um, I'll... I eat fish a lot um, and or some people like, um, you know, just sliced turkey with, you know, like in a lettuce wrap for breakfast with a little bit of pesto or something. There's there's so many ways to get it in. I mean, it's just real, really meal one, not breakfast. Okay. If you think meal one, meal two, meal three, um, it doesn't have to be, you know, eggs and bacon or as, as your only like meat based breakfast option. Yeah, that fits for me as well. I tend to go fasted until around about midday. Just I don't like training on a full stomach and I tend to train mm -hmm. in the morning. So for me, I'll, I'll then like kind of condense that afternoon down. So that very much is kind of like, like early lunch, late lunch, nearly dinner, early dinner, dinner, bed. Like, so the, <laughs> the, uh, it is meal one, two, three, four. Um, what about meat and cancer? Doesn't increasing, in, increasing our meat consumption increase our risk of cancer? Not with fresh red meat. They did find a little bit of an increase with bacon, um, but your average chance of getting colon cancer with um, in the general public is 5% out of like people, right? If you were to eat five slices of bacon every single day for the entire rest of your life, your chance goes from 5% to 6%. OK, but the media reports that as a 20 percent increase. Oh, my gosh, it was actually 18 percent increase. But that but that's still not even twice. That's not even 50 percent the risk. That's it's it's statistically meaningless um, to go from 5 percent to 6 percent. There are so many other great ways to avoid getting cancer, like don't smoke, exercise, uh, eat a, a, a mostly unprocessed food diet in general. Um, you know, anyway, so in the context of a good diet and a good lifestyle, I see no reason why people should be avoiding processed meats, um, either. What about cholesterol? I hear cholesterol's bad and meats are bad and I don't even know what mine is, but I don't want cholesterol. So. Right. What do um, I, do? I go into it in depth in the book and it's interesting because, um, you know, a lot of the hysteria has just been debunked so many times about cholesterol. It's actually taken off the nutrients of concern of the U.S. dietary guidelines now. Wow. Um, but quietly. Uh, so that didn't make too many Slow headlines. Slow retraction, yeah. But yeah. Um, so, you know, we're less afraid of fat these days. So butter is now, you know, kind of making a little bit of a comeback. Actually, butter sales during COVID were through the roof better than ever before, I think, because a lot of people were home baking, too. So that's not necessarily, um, you know, always a good thing. But meat is worse than butter could, right? Because it's it's not only going to kill you, but it's also bad for the environment and it's bad to kill an animal, right? So the anti-meat thing is way worse than the anti-fat thing. Um, because we didn't have, you know, anti-butter people marching around and, you know, <laughs> going after butcher stores and destroying property and um, issuing death threats to people that promoted butter, right? But that's what's happening uh, with the meat movement right now is the anti-meat folks. And we touch on that in the film. We show a story about a butcher shop that was being harassed. Um, and actually has to have a sign permanently in their window now about um, how, you know, there is no such thing as an ethical slaughter. Um, animals have died for your food, you know, stuff like that. Um, it's it's absolutely crazy. And, um, you know, unfortunately, these fringe groups tend to attract people who already are uh, maybe not totally thinking logically but then when you get a b12 deficiency on top of that from being vegan then you get some really radical behavior um and yeah. so you know it's 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 been really interesting for me to see how this all gets expressed yeah it's fascinating for me as well i mentioned earlier on my friend alex um who is one of the best thought through 
vegans, the, the, the single best thought through vegan I've ever met. So he hasn't gone from an emotive perspective. He goes from a philosophical perspective in that he thinks minimizing suffering is something that we should all do. Um, and if I was to dig into, if I was to steal man, his argument versus the mouse argument that you meant, made earlier on, I think that he wouldn't equate the suffering of a, a mouse to the suffering of a cow. Now, again, volume of how many earthworms and everything else is dug up versus killing a cow, all that sort of stuff. A Alex needs to be here to kind of defend himself. My point is that I, he, yeah. he stood out to me uh, because of how robust and well-grounded his understanding was. He spent hundreds of hours debating people in the Oxford University halls and pubs around there um, to ensure that his stance was robust enough for him to make the lifestyle change. He didn't want to go vegan, but he felt compelled to because of something philosophically. Now, mm -hmm. that was surprising to me because that appears to be a rarity. And if everybody was coming up to me and saying, hey man, like here is my incredibly well-read, very well-grounded, calmly, beautifully articulated reason for why I think that veganism is the lifestyle for me. I'm like, yeah, I can have a conversation with him. I enjoy having a conversation mm -hmm. with him. Having pig's blood thrown on me because I own a Canada goose doesn't feel quite the same. And that's got nothing to do with diet. Yeah, yeah. There's definitely ways to intelligently engage people. You know, your friend should probably read this book written by Andrew Smith out of Drexel University. Um, it's called A Critique of the Moral Defense of Vegetarianism. So he is a philosophy professor, PhD. He was an ethical vegan. And he started writing a paper on why he was vegan. And it turned into a book where he talked himself out of it. <laughs> I did a podcast with him a while ago, maybe three years ago. So his name's Andrew Smith. Cool. Um, I did interview him for the film and his interview didn't make it in only because we had some other stronger stories um, that the editors felt were better. But I do um, when we do the global release of the film, um, people are going to have an opportunity to purchase the extended DVD interviews. And his is one of it. Stuff. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. So my pushback to that argument would be, who are you to say that just because an animal is larger, its life is worth more? Like, what is the criteria of life being worth more or less than something else? Would a zebra be worth more or would a giraffe be worth more because it's physically larger? Would that mean that, you know, you are more important than me because I'm smaller? You know, like, where does where does that where do we go with that? Or, you know, a 300 year old maple tree that is the habitat for hundreds um, of little critters and insects and, you know, providing food for, for, and shelter because that's a plant Would the death of that tree be less important than the death of a field mouse. Right. Um, so our, where do we draw the line between like the difference between ecosystem function and health and individual lives? And how do you equip you know, what, why is, why on earth would a mouse be less important than a, you know, or a colony of bees? They're really intelligent. Right. But, you know, so is spraying insecticides. Okay. You know, and if it, isn't okay, then how are we going to produce food without insecticides? Oh, we need animals. But then how are we going to, I feel like I'm on the princess bride. How are we going to, how are we going to, you know, use animal inputs to grow kale if no animals can die? What if an animal dies? Do we put it in the compost or do we just like leave it in the woods? It's going to compost in the woods too. Should we just, you know, like how, what, where do things end and other things begin? And the reality is we're all just molecules being recycled into other molecules, right? Like that's, that's all we are, um, which gets some of the very religious people very frustrated with me. But that is the truth. And, and so, you know, we have to just be looking at, you know, how do we increase the biodiversity? How do we increase the quality of life? What's your opinion on the carnivore diet? 
I think it can be a great tool for someone who has really messed up guts um, and has tried a lot of other things and it hasn't worked. Um, maybe people with extreme autoimmune issues, things like that. Although I think um, as a lifestyle, like just for someone who wants to try it out because it's cool or, you know, just as a weight loss thing, I think people should be eating as many foods that don't give them as pro problems as possible and the mo try to get the most nutrient density we can through food. And um, so as a clinician, I've used it with patients and with amazing success with um, binge eaters sometimes just restricting it all the way down to just meat. So they have no other decision is really actually quite helpful. Amazingly. Um, uh, and I've seen so many more binge eaters during COVID than I've ever seen before. Um, so why do just it in people comforting themselves with food? Yeah. I mean, binge eating tends to be something that comes out of uh, people feeling that they don't have control. And I think it's really hard to feel like you have control over anything during, during this pandemic, time. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, and then also, I mean, just if you have an emotional um, issue with food, a distorted relationship with food, having 24 seven access to your refrigerator is not a good thing, right? I saw this, Humans I, I saw this meme at the beginning of the summer that said, uh, and it was a, a note posted inside of the fridge and it said, you're not hungry. You're just fucking bored. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I actually had it. I saw another cartoon saying that um, the fridge was sentient because it's <laughs> calling your name, you know. <laughs> um, so no other animal has to go around saying, oh, I've had enough. I can't possibly eat. I better stop eating all those coconuts. You know, like all animals are wired to seek out food. Um as diverse as possible. Uh, so that's called optimum foraging strategies An awesome paper written about that. Um, so humans are wired to, you know, eat some of these berries, but then you kind of get a little like full on those, but then there's always room for those berries, right? Because those ones are, they have a different nutrients in them. Um, but so when we're confronted with all these nutrient poor processed foods that stimulate us to overeat, we have no off switch for them. It's very easy to see why people are overweight. Um, and it's really not their fault. It's, it's, we've engineered ourselves into a really disturbing relationship with food. The arms race is incredibly unfair. I learned the words orification at the beginning of this year, which I think is the design of the texture of foods. And hmm. one of the, examples or a couple of the examples that were given is that um ancestrally it would be very rare for us to come across a food which had multiple textures in it like you mm. get a bunch of berries they're kind of slimy you get some kale it's also kind of slimy you get some meat it's kind of like a little bit more tough and chewy and you get something that's been out in the sun and it's dry and crispy or whatever um but if you look at most foods that are really weaponized for overeating like fries or oreos there is a contrast to the texture, crispy on the outside and fluffy and light on the inside. And mm. that helps to bypass. Obviously, uh, another one of them is the balance between carbohydrates and fat. And fat. That yeah, tends yeah, to be yeah. in there as well, which is why cheesecake is such a bastard. Oh, it's my favorite. Because you've yeah. got this, you've got the buttery biscuit base and then you've got the cream on top and then you've got the, the tanginess, the sweetness of the jam. So you can sugar and fat and then a little bit more carbs at the bottom. Like it's yeah. hard, it's hard to say no. Um, so we've, that's the stuff we shouldn't be eating. What are the rules that I can follow so that I make sure that I get good meat? I go to the supermarket tomorrow or I go shopping online tomorrow. What do I do? Um, you know, I, it, if there's two things, you know, one is for health, right? So there's not a massive difference uh, in nutritional quality between a totally grass-fed steak and a steak that was finished on a feedlot. Um, and so even if you don't have a lot of money, your, your best money is spent on the more red meats than chicken or pork. Um, just because nutritionally it's just a powerhouse, right? Uh, organ meats are going to be a really good choice for you. Um, when we're, you know, local fish, um, I love fish. I actually prefer the taste of fish to, to meat. Um, it's all just animal flesh though. I don't know why we like say Every, like meat. Fish, every, everyone, you know. and you're from Boston, right? Or you're in Boston. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um everyone I know from Boston absolutely adores seafood and fish. Oh. Everyone. Huh. I went out, I went out there and I got taken for a 
ro- some sort of roll with lobster. Large roll. Yeah, with lobster like shredded in it. Yeah. And covered in butter. Yeah. <laughs> You've never heard of a lobster roll before. No. <laughs> British. What do you think we have over here? Fish and chips. Battered fish, chips, and weak tea. That's what we've got over here. <laughs> Uh, yeah, lobster roll is pretty, well, I didn't actually grow up here. Um, but, but yeah, I love the, I love fish and, and when someone comes, you have to take them out for a lobster roll. That's, That's what, what you do or me. clam chowder. That's yeah. Precisely what happened to me. Uh huh. Um, so, uh, so I highly recommend that, um, folks just try to get food as close to the source as possible. If you have the opportunity to go find a farmer to buy your meat directly from them, um, and that's not always an option. I know in Iceland they couldn't do that because of government regulations. Like they had to sell it. They it had like all had to, the government set the price for lamb. Um, oh wow! So uh, anyway, I just um, you know as much as you can support local farmers, you know buy you know, British beef, British lamb, not the imported stuff. Um, because that's what's keeping the British landscapes beautiful is the farming culture there and. Um, I saw a big divide between like city and farming, um, you know, urban and rural when I was there, we have that here too in America and it's really unfortunate. Um, so, uh, you know, supporting the people that are in your own region that are producing, working hard to produce food and also keeping things beautiful is, um, and healthy is, is the best. I get it. Diana, thank you. Where can people go? They want to watch the film. They want to buy the book. Where do they go? Yeah, so sacredcow.info, they can sign up. We're doing the free global preview of the film November 22nd through 30th. Um, it's going to be only that week, and then it's going to go away. It's going into distribution. It'll be available on mainstream platforms starting in January. And in, in North America, I don't know when it's coming to the UK. So this is your chance. So it's November um, 22nd to the 30th. Uh, the book is available wherever books are sold. Um, I have info on, on the website and then folks can follow me on Instagram at sustainable dish. You are pounding the Instagram at the moment. You've got some really cool infographics and stuff on there. Whoever's putting your, uh, your artwork He's awesome. together. James Serious. Cooper, all the way from Tasmania, actually, um, is, is my you're designer. Crushing it, man. You're crushing it. Yeah, totally. He is. Everything yeah. will be linked in the show notes below. Diana, thank you so much for today. Thank you. Thank you.